Hello, Shannon. I suspect you're probably not getting a lot of snow, but what you are all getting is a lot of Future Trends Forum. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, it's the top of the hour, so I'd like to begin. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's host. I'm its creator. I'm your chief cat herder for the next hour of conversation. We've hosted Terry before, and I find that trying to describe Terry uh, is actually kind of exhausting because she seems to be a one-woman army. Uh, she's a political scientist with several published books, and I don't know how many articles under her belt in a faculty career. She's also been in, in the administrative world, leading and working on programs. She's also an author, as I mentioned, with books. She's a leader and a consultant, and she does this all with incredible aplomb and grace. What we're here to talk about now is her new book called Radical Empathy, and you can see a link to it in the bottom left of the screen, that little box that says Radical Empathy. And her idea is to use Radical Empathy to help address racial divides in campuses in the United States. What does this mean? How does this work? Let me invite Terry Givens up on stage to explore with all of us. Well, welcome, Dr. Givens. Greetings. <laughs> oh, it's so good to see you. Welcome aboard. Welcome Thanks aboard. Thanks so much. Yeah. Where where are you coming from today? Well, today I'm in California, but yesterday I was in Montreal, Cal Ca Canada. Um, I am teaching at McGill University, and we're heading into our winter break. What? So, what? And, and you're also at McGill? Oh, yeah. this is incredible! I mean, <laughs> you're, you, there must be an army of clones that make all this work for you. This is incredible. What, what are you teaching? What are you teaching at McGill? Um, political science and specifically compared. So um, speaking of books I've authored, uh, I wrote uh, one of the first textbooks to, to really cover uh, comparative immigration politics and mm. it's called Immigration in the 21st Century. Mm -hmm. And so I taught that class in the fall and this spring. I'm teaching a class on transatlantic race and immigration politics. And so that goes along oh, with wow. my other book, which is called The Roots of Racism, mm -hmm. which uh, we could talk about another time. Um, but it goes into kind of the, why, you know, I mean, it starts off kind of, it's a pretty broad, you know, look at my research and, and others research over the years which um, shows how we haven't really brought race to the fore and that race in, even in the discipline of political science has been marginalized for, for various reasons partly because you don't see people like me <laughs> as as much as you should and actually that's what i'm doing at mcgill i'm the provost academic lead and advisor on the strategy to address anti-black racism oh, wow. and so i'm working with the provost office um, to bring uh, in specifically more black faculty and I also do workshops on radical empathy for my colleagues around campus to help them create a better uh, space and environment. Not only do we need to recruit these people, but we need to bring them in and retain them. Indeed, indeed. Oh, that's a lot of lot of work. I, you know, normally we ask people to talk about what they're working on for the next year. It sounds like that's a full plate. Yes. Uh, well, con congratulations at that appointment and uh, what looks like just a very powerful position to be in. Yes. It's, uh, oh. it's a lot of work. <laughs> I, I have to say something about that, though, because when I uh, was talking to them about taking this job about a year ago, um, you know, they had only in a couple of years, well, I'll say two and a half years ago, they only had eight black faculty out of 1700 at McGill. And we're now pushing 30. But um, it was just incredibly amazing to me that such a high ranking institution could be yeah. so behind. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, well, good luck, good luck. Yes. Um, I look forward to hearing uh, that number get higher and higher. Um, I, Ter, I, I, if, I just want us to begin with, um, your book just sounds fantastic. Uh, what is radical empathy? What do, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm gonna, um, I'll put in the chat the, the, the so the, first of all, let me say why I wrote this book. Um, you know, I, had been following, I mean, throughout my career in life, um, you know, trying to understand a lot variety of issues, but also, you know, having my own lived experience, um, you know, in terms of, you know, where I grew up and, and, you know, I'm the first in my family to, you know, go to college, let alone get a PhD and, you know, understanding how structural discrimination has played a role in everything from, you know, my father's heart attack at the age of 73 to my own, you know, health issues to the challenges I faced being uh, a woman and a, a 
a black woman leader in, in academia. And so I wanted to do something that would help to understand why we have these racial divides and ways that we can actually take action. So the really important component of radical empathy is um, you know, taking action. But the first step is a willingness to be vulnerable. And you know, that was hard for me, but important to me because that, and people ask me, well, you know, do we need to be vulnerable with, especially you know, if you're a woman or a person of color, you know, trying to be vulnerable around some folks is, you know, feels like you're just opening yourself up to attack. But it's not being, you know, necessarily be willingness to be vulnerable, um, you know, to others. It's starting with yourself. And really, the one of the key focuses of radical empathy is we each need to understand our own, and it's very much about storytelling. And mm. we can come back to that in a minute. But um, mm. the, this idea of being vulnerable, really, for me, meant being a, willing to do that deep dive and understanding the choices my parents made in terms of how we grew up and where we grew up and, and um, you know, internalized oppression and re respectability politics and all these things that, that influenced my life and how that formed me as a person. And once I was able to, to pull that together, then the, the next step is called, or is, um, um, you know, becoming grounded in who you are. Mm. And uh, I'm going to type that in. And the important thing about becoming grounded in who you are is that, you know, you really have to learn to, to um, be accepting of yourself and have empathy for yourself. And so, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Whitney Houston and her song, The Greatest Love of All is one of my favorites. Um, you know, you have to learn to love yourself before you can love others. And I really believe that is such a key component because that then leads to the next step, which is um, being open to the experiences of others. And um, so that uh, being grounded in who you are makes you more, I believe, open to others' experiences because you don't want anybody putting you into a box or you know telling you who you are when you know you're the one who knows who you are so i talk a lot about you know there's the golden rule which is you know being you know get, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you but um it's really i believe in the platinum rule which is doing unto others as they would have you do unto them <laughs> Right. So it's not saying, oh, I want you to treat me just like I want to be treated. It's like I, I have respect for you and I want to learn who you are as a person and I want to treat you the way you want to be treated. Um, so that's that's an important step. And then the next is uh, pra really uh, practicing empathy, because empathy is not something that really comes easily to all of us. Um, and, you know, I feel like I'm an empathic per person, um, but yeah, and I, you know, I really got interested in empathy when I was younger. Um, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, and there's a Star Trek episode called The Empath, and those of you who know it know it talks about this woman who, you know, uh, Kirk and Spock and McCoy are abducted to this planet to help her, and she's trying to learn how to use her abilities around empathy and not only um, you know, taking on people's, you know, putting herself in other people's shoes, but actually taking on people's, you know, injuries and so on. And anyway, so that got me intrigued with the idea of empathy, but it's something you have to practice and just like Jim had to in that Star Trek episode. <laughs> so practicing uh, empathy is, is really critical. And then the next step, which is the radical component of it is um, taking action. And, you know, taking action is so important because I feel like we, um, you know, I, I walk, when I'm in California, I live in Menlo Park and I walk around the neighborhood and I see all the Black Lives Matter signs and everything. It's like, but what are you really doing? And, you know, do you really understand the this neighborhood and why it is the way it is and, and why there aren't as many Black people living here as you might expect otherwise and so on. And so I really challenge people to take a walk around your neighborhood, um, try to understand um you know why things ended up the way they did you know we the problem is we're very passive you know sometimes about these things we're like and even when we want to take action it's like oh okay i'm going to go march well it has to go beyond that um you know it has to go beyond these these kind of um punctuated equilibria as we political scientists like to say of, you know, incidents like george floyd it has we have to understand that structural discrimination is impacting everything in our lives and every day of our lives and so um it's really important to understand that 
the place where you live is the way it is because of structural discrimination. The schools we are working in or go to are the way they are because of structural discrimination. Um, you know, all these things are impacting us. And then finally, um, uh, besides practicing empathy and taking action, we want to create change and build trust. And so, um, you know, I really want, so every chapter of the book uh, ends with actions that people can take. So I wanted this to be a very action oriented uh, book, something that people can take and, and learn something from, but also, you know, imagine if all the people of goodwill went out there and really tried to create change, right? Um, that would be a movement that could really change the world. It would indeed, it would indeed. Uh so we start off with, with um, that kind of uh, uh, vulnerability and mm -hmm. you know, accepting other people, then proceeding to storytelling and the platinum rule and then ending with action. This is quite a ladder to climb up. Uh, I, I have more questions for you, Terry, but the, the forum is, is, is for everybody else to have their questions. So friends, if you're new to the forum, just remember, press that raised hand to join us on stage or type in the question mark uh, with your question or answer. Uh, and we have a few questions that have already come in and I wanna make sure that uh, everyone gets a chance. And there's one right here, just, I think this is uh, another take on what you just said from Jim Venides, uh, who asks, let me bring it up here. What is your working definition of empathy? More than caring, I suspect. Yeah, and there's different types of empathy. There's kind of the cognitive empathy that says, okay, I, I understand you have issues, you know, I, I see you have problems, you know, I, I want to deal with them. And it, 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 it goes beyond that to actually trying to, you know, put yourself in that other person's space to, uh, and the, so, and the way we do that is the storytelling. So I'll start off with, you know, the story I start off with in the book, which is, um, you know, a story of my family gathering um, and, you know, my father there, you know, being so proud of his children and, and grandchildren. And this was, you um, in 2001, um, I, my son, Bert, uh, Andrew, was about nine months old, and I had just had the opportunity to invite my parents to come and visit me in Seattle. At the time, I was at University of Washington, and I really wanted them to see me in action as a professor, you know, wearing my, uh, so I invited them to the political science graduation and wearing my um, regalia and all that, and it was really exciting for me to have them see, you know, what I'd become, and they came to the reception afterwards. And then two weeks later, my dad had passed away from from a heart attack and um you know it was just this horrifying situation you know it was the first very close family member who i lost and and you know i mean at the time you know it's when i had a nine month old so i had to kind of tamp down my my grief and and you know be there for him but um you know, as I began to try and understand it, being a researcher, you know, once I got past my grief, um, which is something you really never get over, but in any case, um, I started looking into it. It's like, well, what happened? Why did this happen to my father? And, and at such, you know, 73, relatively young. And um, the first, one of the first things I learned is that uh, just being an African-American male puts you at higher risk of heart disease, having a heart attack, dying from a, your first heart attack. And I was just horrified. And, uh, you know, that started me down a path of trying to understand, you know, I had had my own experience in my late twenties when I uh, was having, you know, horrible issues with pain and so on and endometriosis. And, you know, I finally found a doctor who would treat me. And he, he actually told me, you know, I bet you've had a lot of doctors tell you that black women don't get endometriosis. And I was like, well, not directly, but yeah, they, they wouldn't, you know, really treat me. And this whole issue of pain and so on is, um, you know, something that uh, is problematic, you know, the data in the chapter on health disparities is just horrifying when you realize, you know, there's all, medical students who believe that black people have thicker skin and don't experience pain the same way. And, and then you can imagine how that translates into the education system where, you know, I mean, I saw this all the time. I mean, it, there was almost an expectation that as when I, as being a black student, when I would walk into a classroom and, you know, I knew the teacher didn't know me or my family, they'd immediately assume, you know, there's a problem student. 
when, you know, in reality, I was a straight A student. And so you just, the sad truth is we internalize this oppression and we just assume, okay, I'm going to get discriminated again. So I have to be prepared for that. And I'm going to, you know, and, and, but you, you also forget how just exhausting that is when you always have to make the assumption, okay, I'm black. So people are going to discriminate against me and I have to prove myself over and over again. Wow. Um, that's a very, very powerful answer. And I, I, I and I think that yes, should your storytelling power again, uh, which you mentioned. Jim, thank you for the good question. Uh, we have more questions coming. Uh, and there's one that comes from our friend Tom Ames, uh, and who asks a very practical question. How do we get the political leadership <laughs> like my own, or Texas, to be vulnerable instead of defensive? Or all yeah. that, I would say or just plain awful. Um, I was just, I've lived in Texas for 12 years. I was at University of Texas at Austin. And um, so I, I know that situation very well. And unfortunately, and, and you know, there's a lot of these politicians there who are just out for power. And it's not gonna be the politicians who are gonna change. It's the people who have to change. And that's, you know, something I really emphasize is, you know, Empathy is not absolution, first of all. It's something my friend Greg Sattel says all the time. And um, I say that because there are toxic people out there who you just, you know, you're not going to be able to connect with them. And there are people out there who, um, you know, you have to understand, you know, sure, you can have empathy for them, but you don't have to agree with them. Actually, you can vehemently disagree with them and still, you know, try to make those connections. But, and, you know, I just saw, I was sharing on Facebook with some friends, the, you know, what they're doing around trans youth in, in Texas, which is just horrifying. Yeah. Um, and so I think that uh, it's what, what I, the people I'm trying to target are the people who could eventually, you know, hopefully, you know, vote these people out of office if that's what they want to do. Um, and so it's important to sh to start sharing your perspectives and stories with other people around you. So my advice to Tom is, is yeah, you can't legislate culture, but you can you can influence your friends and family, and sometimes not always your family, as I know I have many friends who have family members they can't influence, but there are people you can influence, and we have to, you know, I mean, we can't just step back and say, oh, I'm not going to do anything, um, because it's just too much. It's the little things that actually can build into more, so. As in kind of social movement or a cultural mm -hmm. transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I want to, because I'm seeing Katie's uh, story uh, issue about storytelling and empathy. Um, actually, yeah, we have to we have to uh, create examples. So I want to tell a story about what I did in my own classroom this semester because we're talking about race issues and indigenous issues and so many different things. And so one of the things I did in the classroom actually is I started off um, and I reached out to some friends on, on Facebook and political science and said, hey, do you guys have your doc? I mean, I have my own documentation on how to create a brave and safe space because I do these workshops all the time, but I wanted to see how other colleagues were doing it in the classroom space. And so I found some great resources. And what I did is I, the first day of class, you know, I did the introduction, but then I said, okay, the next class, we were going to sit down and we're, you know, we were on Zoom at the time and we're going to break up into groups. And I want you guys to give me three different things, each group to give me three different things you want us to make sure we do in the class uh, to, and I gave them you know some idea you know, we have to be respectful and you know so on and allow people to make mistakes etc but you can create that environment in your classroom it's you know it's not easy necessarily at times but I have to say you know first of all it sets a tone for the class and the students know what to expect and that they are going to be heard even if they have a you know a difference of opinion with somebody and you know i also created an online forum so that students who didn't feel like they could speak up in class could speak up in the forum and it's really just been amazing the students have just been you know i, I mean we did a class on citizenship on a uh, discussion on tuesday and i've never heard so many amazing stories you know about and so we get storytelling happening in the classroom where one student talked about how her italian mother went back and got citizenship in Italy when they they were, were offering it to Italians. But then she took it the next step and really um, talked about how that was something that related to immigration and race because they wanted to reach out to Italians in the U.S. who you know, were phenotypically you know, white so that they could have more Italian uh, citizens who fit what they felt was Italian. What is it? What a story. I mean, are, are those students undergrads or grad students? Undergrad, upper division undergrads. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Um, 
Well, uh, again, thank you for the um, uh, for the question. Uh, we have uh, that you hoisted from chat. Speaking of which, there was a uh, there was a, a, a comment here, and I want to make sure I, I get it right uh, from Kelly Simpson. Kelly, if I, got, if I have this wrong, please please correct me. Um, she says that there is the progression from um, compassionate empathy or simple compassion and how that manifests action. And she actually begins by talking about cognitive empathy as more of a teaching mm -hmm. skill versus emotional empathy. Yes. Um, Kelly, if, if you want to join us, by the way, here, I'll just I'll make it even easier. I'll just put a, there's a podium there and you just click that if you want to join us, if you can. Otherwise, just please type in the chat and I'll be happy to voice that. So cognitive uh, empathy, emotional empathy, and the kind of progression from there. What, what, what do you think about that, Terry? Well, absolutely. There's definitely, so it's easy, you know, um, Cognitive empathy is easier because it doesn't require you to, you know, really dig into the, the emotional side of things. And, um, and then, you know, and I'm not a psychologist, so this is, you know, not my particular area of expertise, but um, uh, I've had to really think through, you know, kind of, there's almost a progression in terms of empathy. And that's why I came up with these six steps, because it's like, how do you get to that emotional component if you haven't done the internal work first? So I think the internal work is really critical to get beyond that top, just the cognitive empathy and compassion, really. So compassion is wonderful, but it doesn't necessarily lead to action. And that's why I think that internal work is a critical component to get to, um, and we have to do that internal work. Our students are, you know, are pretty insightful and, um, you know, and we also have to model, you know, that I idea of making mistakes and, um, mm. you know, I, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to do in the class <laughs> because, you know, you're the sage on the stage and, and all that. But um, I think it's important to, you know, I mean, my students can look at my book and, you know, they can see all kinds of, of modeling, but, um, I think it's important to tell our stories, you know, and talk about how, you know, even I talk about what it was like when I was a student or working with my, my boys who one's in, who's in college and one who's on the way and say, hey, I, I can see what you guys are dealing with because I, I deal with it with my, my own sons and my own experiences. This, this is getting more and more complex and at the same time more and more powerful, um, which is terrific. Uh, we had a, a very practical question from uh, Don Shawless, a good friend of the program, and it asks, can you tell us about free resources that viewers can use to make radical empathy a practice? Yes, uh, absolutely. Because, And actually, I'm going to put the link to the reading guide. Uh, so even if you don't have a copy of the book, you can actually um, you know, use the uh, reading guide as a means to, um, you know, see the difference you know it's, it's kind of a shortcut and it also but the the nice thing about the reading guide is that it um also uh you know has um various sorry yeah, it's not if it's coming through or not um but um you know additional resources so i have a you know it's not just my book there's you know all kinds of books you can look at to, that are helpful in terms of um understanding the different components so i'll mention a few um uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, The Warmth of Other Sons, had a big impact on me um, in terms of understanding my own parents uh, and their, the Great Migration and how they ended up where they did. And my mother came from Louisiana and went to Los Angeles, and there's a great story in The, the Warmth of Other Sons about that. Um, Heather McGee's book, The Sum of Us, is just wonderful in terms of understanding structural discrimination and, and how it you know, it, it impacts us uh, in various ways. She starts off talking about how you know many cities and and uh, counties drained pools because they didn't want to have them desegregated. You know, and this, you know, you, you got, I'm sure many of you know the stories about schools. You know, shutting down schools. Um, and uh, yeah, sorry, the file link isn't working. I'm not sure why that is, but um, well, in any case, if you go to if you go to the Bristol University Press website and uh, type in radical empathy, then uh, the publisher has a whole list of, including the reading guide, a whole list of resources as well. Oh, good. Um, so my web link, well, here, let me try putting the web link in. But um, uh, in any case, uh, yeah, there's, and plus, if you just Google me, besides the talk today, um, I've done tons of podcasts and, and webinars, and, and there we go. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, I don't know if that you can copy and paste the link, I believe. Um, 
So, um, in any case, uh, yeah, that's uh, actually I was linking from the the somebody saying it's linking from it, but I was actually I co co copied the um, link from the website. But anyway, that's fine. If you go to the website, you can download it. So. Well, there we go. Um, Don, thank you for the very practical question, and uh, Terry, thank you for the rich answer. Those are some great. Mm -hmm. uh, we have more questions, and friends, if you can tell that. Um, Professor Givens is extremely um, welcoming to all questions, so please uh, don't be shy. Uh, and also, if you'd like to join us on stage for video, just uh, press that little um, podium button and you can join us. Uh, we have a question from uh, David Scobie, who uh, comes back to the, some of the emotional questions here. Uh, how do you think about the role of anger as a barrier to empathy, maybe, as a source of agency, maybe, in connection with empathy? How do you deal with anger in others in engaging race and racism? Well, I have a, a that's a very excellent question, David, because, um, so, and, and, you know, so, and again, I, I have stories, but um, for me, anger was something really difficult to deal with because I grew up with a mother who had, and I talk about this in the book, borderline personality disorder. And so for me, her, you know, what I, when I saw anger, I saw, you know, my mother exploding right and so and then on the other side i had my father who was very you know um reserved and you know so on so um for me anger was a very negative emotion and it took me many years in therapy and all that to figure out no if you don't express your anger um in a constructive way then it just eats you up inside and so um, I learned how to, to deal with my anger in a more constructive way. And so for me personally, that was my, you know, I had a pretty long path to figuring out how to deal with anger. But um, also, uh, you know, in terms of anger more broadly, um, you know, it, it can be hard when somebody is confronting you with anger. And, um, and I think what's important is not to feed into that um, and to you know, respond similarly, but uh, you know, that's a, a place where maybe some compassion might be helpful. But it, you know, it really depends on the particular situation. Um, and you know, I certainly feel a lot of anger about the way <laughs> we've dealt with race and other issues in this, you know, in this country. Um, but I also know I need to channel it into constructive ways to create change. And so that's, I mean, that's part of the reason I wrote this book is to try to find ways to, um, you know, get, because, you know, anger is a very strong emotion, but it also can be utilized to um, mobilize, right? So I think we have to look at taking our anger as a means of mobilizing folks to say, you know, look, we, you know, we don't want this to be happening anymore um and we need to change it and so anger you know is powerful but it, it can also be uh you know a means to that can help us lead to change but i really think it has to be combined with a broader understanding and educating ourselves about you know rather than just you know acting you know with immediate you know emotion but taking you know for me it's taking a step back and saying what's really going to create that change is it you know me um you know, being out there marching in the streets or talking to my pol you know, politicians, to, uh, getting my friends and neighbors to vote. Um, you know, there's all these different ways to address it. Well, and political scientists can help us with that in great detail. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Don uh, Charles in the chat says very eloquently, sometimes the pain is talking. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah. David, uh, David Scobie, thank you for the great question. David's the uh, lead, by the way, of bringing theory to practice, which is a fantastic, fantastic group. Um, more questions are coming. Um, this is great. Uh, you're clearly uh, striking uh, a theme that people really want to explore. Um, uh, this is, uh, I guess we, we're shifting a little more closely into the classroom, or at least the campus setting. Jim Venides has a follow-up question. Mind is blown. So as an online instructor, how do I get better at identifying structural discrimination in my course department and university? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, there's lots of ways. I mean, the first is to take a look at, you know, 
I mean, it's a very complicated question because, you know, this, it's funny, I was just talking with some colleagues about the student life cycle. And we often, you know, we get our students at a particular point in their life cycle, but it goes all the way back to K through 12, to how they apply, to whether they're admitted or not, to, you know, the, I mean, there's so many different points. Um, and I'm trying to encourage my colleagues to think about the student, the broader student lifestyle and, um, thinking about where do we need to provide those interventions to undermine structural discrimination. So we know K through 12 discrimination in our school systems is pretty, well, at least for me, it's pretty obvious in the way that we do funding and, mm -hmm. um, and so on. And so I work with a lot of organizations that, uh, including when I'm on the board of Foundation for a College Education that helps kids um, starting in freshman year of high school to make sure because in California, if you don't take a certain set of courses, you aren't even eligible for the public uh, UC system. Um, and so, and a lot of parents don't know, it's first generation especially don't know that all these you know things you have to do starting from freshman year to, to get through. So, I mean, I'm, I'm broadening your, your question, Jim, but uh, if, we, if we start to understand that a lot of our students um, are facing these challenges, you know, even before they get to us, then we can start to think about how do we mitigate some of those at different points of the, the system. So for example, you know, I mean, just, uh, you know, as you're thinking about teaching your students, um, you know, keeping in mind that some of them, you know, may not understand some of the terminology you're using, you know, taking a step back and saying, you know, or asking your students, you know, what's, what's your experience? Um, you know, do you need extra help on, on particular areas? Um, and knowing that they are coming from very different backgrounds and and um, will need different levels of support, making sure you tell them what resources are, you know, as faculty, I've seen this happening more and more since I started out, that we're, you know, tr trying to provide more resources for students um, to help them at different points of the, uh, you know, system, you know, as they enter and go through um, and, you know, in our classes, you know, whether it's writing or math skills, you know, all these different things. So. But the first step, I think, is really thinking about who who is who are these students sitting in front of me, <laughs> and um, you know what can I do to make this learning experience more equitable and inclusive for for them, and that's really dependent on who you're looking at and where they're coming from. Well, this is I, how I mean. Do you think, Terry, that maybe this is a way to begin the first year student experiences with? Mm -hmm. Radical empathy exercises and practice it, and that would be enormous. It's, but, it's, but it's not just the first year students; it's the first year, it's the faculty, right? I mean, that's what I've spent a lot of this last year doing is, is training our, our, and I haven't really even broken up. I started with our leadership team, you know, training them in radical empathy. So that when you know, it's funny. Uh, we, we were a group of fact, one of the uh, vice uh, provosts got started a group to talk about kind of innovation and teaching and you know they laid out their terms of reference and all that and I talked to the two chairs and I said well have you guys thought about you know in inclusion and equity in, in this process and they're like, oh well maybe we need to add another part to our terms of reference and and really that my goal is to take a step back and say let's put an equity lens over everything that we do because if we don't it's not just black students or, or you know, indigenous students or whoever who are impacted, all of our students are impacted. So if we start to look at things with more of an equity lens, um, you know, then we we can make sure that we aren't excluded. You know, we, we are, you know, unfortunately, students are going to get excluded. You know, we can't fix everything at once. But if we can at least start with that equity lens, um, you know, then we can at, uh, begin to you know, start to address some of the things that we don't even think about because we're just, it's what we're used to. You know, you have to really challenge the status quo. Which is a, which is a lot. I, I do want to ask if, if I could, uh, um, Jim, just do you have, Jim asked a question about teaching online. And uh, of course, we all now have a lot more experience with that than we did just three years ago. Um, are there any particular dimensions for this, um, for this work in the online experience? I mean, that is, do you, do you prefer that people uh, use video as opposed to text or images? Because the video, you can see a whole person. Um, do you do you have a preference for asynchronous versus synchronous work with technology and trying to do radical empathy? If you could just say a little bit more about that. 
Um, yeah, I think that um, synchronous is much easier in terms of, you know, the radical empathy component. But um, I, you know, like I said, I, I actually am, am working with a company to develop some synch asynchronous uh, courses to help, you know, because part of the question is, how do you scale this up? Right. And um, so I think we're, we're, you know, the only way to scale it up because, you know, people you know, want me as well as the, the radical empathy. And I, I, I'm one person. And you, as you noted at the beginning, I do a lot. So, um, but, you know, in, so we have to learn how to, to utilize asynchronous in a way that is meaningful. And so I'm, I'm coming up with like little modules and, and things that, um, you know, we can ad address some of the issues that I think students, but, you know, even in my own classroom, right? I'm using asynchronous and synchronous means because um, I think that the underlying issue here is we need to provide a variety of, of ways for students to, you know, interact, but also like when I'm training you know, other faculty and so on. And so there's no one set way to do it, but we have to learn how to use all of these tools, synchronous, asynchronous, you know, um, you know, face to face, uh, you know, in ways that allow people to, to get this in, in, in different ways. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Wendy Williams uh, asked about this as well in the chat. She was curious about how can she respond in an asynchronous online course to students making themselves vulnerable and talking mm -hmm. about discrimination. So I think, I think that addresses it. And our, our good friend Lisa Durf um, mentions, quote, I begin class with a synchronous video meeting for all. I have all students thanking me for connections. So that's, that's very powerful. Yeah, but the other way is um, to set up small group um, meetings with students synchronously. So if, uh, online. So that's what I did is, um, you know, I would set up small, you know, or even office hours, right? Synchronous yeah. office hours for students yeah. to come or invite a student if you see they're having, they're struggling or raise something in class, uh, either asynchronously or synchronously. So there's, there's a, so many ways to, to do that. Well, this is, uh, so thank you, Wendy, for the good question. And thank you, Lisa, uh, for the, uh, well, Lisa just chimed in so that she does virtual office hours too. Um, I love how, how practical this is getting. Um, but we have a, a kind of foundational question from John Hollenbeck, and, and this is this is a this is a deep kind of a, a very very powerful question. I wanted to make sure that we could grapple with this seriously. Is the current academic environment worthy of this discussion? Can it structurally accommodate cultures beyond white European males? Does it really provide useful learning? Um, my answer to that is. Um, yes and <laughs> you know it's it's not a, a yes you know this is a great environment but it's yes and we we have a lot of work to do um so the current academic environment i would say um is changing i mean i've seen it change in my 20 years or more <laughs> more in higher ed and um and don't forget that there are institutions like hbcus and, and others that are you know but even, but even often in those environments, you might see a more Eurocentric approach to learning. Um, but, you know, we've all kind of grown up in, in here in the U.S., at least in this kind of, you know, uh, I mean, it's like saying even, you know, even K through 12 is that way. So I don't think um, higher ed is any different than the rest of our society um, in terms of being very Eurocentric. So I wouldn't pick, you know, I mean, yes, um, higher ed is, is more resistant to change. And, you know, I, one of the things I just posted on Facebook recently is that um, if you find yourself saying that this is the way we've always done things, then it, it means that you, you need to change it. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I think that there is value in the way we do things, but it is painfully slow, as Lisa just said, um, and there are high barriers to entry, but, um, you know, people like me are, are working on that, you know, at McGill. We now have, you know, a lot more uh, black faculty than they did a couple of years ago. It's not enough and there's a lot more work to do. But, you know, we have to take on these challenges and, you know, we're not going to change these structures. I mean, in terms of the broader 
you know, we're, we're going to have the, the these institutions are, are very um, resilient in many ways. Um, and so I really think we need to find ways to create change within these institute, institutions. Um, some aren't, you know, I, I, and I have, you know, I know some of the folks who I have these ongoing discussions with, um, including Brian, are here and, and we, we're constantly talking about this, you know, how do we change uh, make create you know significant and, and lasting change in higher education to make it more accessible and inclusive, and it's an ongoing discussion. So you know I'm not the kind of person who's you know I I'm not going to give up <laughs> certainly because of the nature of these institutions, but I, I do think you know we can see change happening. Well, thank, first of all, just uh, Fatima, you seem to be having a problem with connection. If you can hear me, why don't you just reload the page? Uh, that might improve it. Otherwise, you may have a connection speed issue on your end. Uh, if you can't uh, hear me, I also just type that up uh, in the chat. Um, or if you want to chat me, let me know uh, what's going on. Uh, Terry, thank you for uh, that heartfelt, nuanced answer to an incredibly uh, deep and uh, almost despairing question. John, thank you uh, for, uh, for coming up with that. That's very, very powerful. Uh, we have more questions that are still coming in. Uh, George Station, our, our good friend here, has a, a question that builds on part of this. Uh, he asks, how might radical empathy connect with culturally responsive teaching, culturally relevant pedagogy, and similar concepts with the equity lens? So I think culturally responsive teaching is great and so on. The, but I think those of us who are using those methods or you know teachers need to take a step back and understand how that's why I, I start with the you know understanding you know yourself being vulnerable and because I think a lot of times people come at this culturally responsive teaching with that white supremacy frame right it's you know um, and so if you, you can't understand that you're, you're coming at it what framework you are coming at it from then um, you know you 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 are only reifying those uh, you know uh, approaches that are you know not supportive or inclusive of a wide range of students, and so um, that's why I say you have to start with yourself and understand what perspective you are coming from before you start to take on these um, approaches that are trying to uh, deal with um, you know a longstanding set of structural discrimination and white supremacy. Starting with yourself. That's the first step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, w friends, we have uh, just about 10 minutes left. So if you have any questions, now is a time to, uh, to plunge them in. Um, and we have a couple, uh, one from Lynn Sabulski. Uh, and Lynn asks another very practical question. What advice would you give to college bound minority students regarding how to evaluate majority white institutions? Well, I'm just doing that right now with my own children. <laughs> my son, I have one son at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, and my younger son is a senior in high school, and he's in the process of deciding where to go. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so um, I mean, you know, and I'm somebody who went to predominantly white institutions. I, you know, I did my undergrad at Stanford and um, my PhD at UCLA. Um, and, you know, I just, you know, it's funny, you know, I didn't have any experience or understanding of, you know, HBCUs because I grew up in Spokane, Washington. And, mm -hmm. um, and frankly, I don't think my parents would have steered me that way because, you know, they, their families had left the South long ago. Um, but I do encourage students nowadays to look at HBCUs because actually if you look at, you know, kind of the broader black excellence in the, in the U.S., um, a lot of those people came from HBCUs and, and were successful. And so um, I think HBCUs are, and they're getting a lot of support and attention now. Um, but, you know, not it's not they're not for everybody. And so, you know, for, for my um, younger son or my older son, he's very much. You know, so I think it's really you have to look at what's the best fit for, for each student. So I, I don't try to generalize because you know, for my son who went to Lewis and Clark, that's a very predominantly white institution, but they are also 
you know, they just uh, um, actually she was the vice president for student affairs. Now is going to be a black woman um, is going to be the president of Lewis and Clark. And so I could see that the institution was very open to you know, broadening their approach to diversity when they initially hired uh, Robin Holmes Sullivan to be their VP for student affairs. And, and you know, my son felt comfortable there. He has, you know, lots of good friends. And for my younger son, um, you know, it's more of an issue of, uh, you know, he's got ADHD and I, I want him to be in a nurturing environment when it comes to, you know, access and, and um, you know, uh, accommodations and, and all of that. So, I, you know, it depends on, on the, the student and, you know, I, like I said, I work with these organizations and they, they you know, the, it's funny, the West Coast organizations have really had to refocus their efforts and um, look at HBCUs and, and his, other, you know, colleges that might have uh, larger, uh, you know, minority populations and, you know, give those kids more options. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's um I really appreciate, especially how, how you dove into individual um, people and individual fit uh, and how, mm -hmm. how important that is. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, um, uh, Lynn, for a really, really good question. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, another question coming in from uh, uh, Rick Sluter. Uh, let me bring this up on stage here. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens in the classroom means everything. You know, shaping the culture and creating a sense of urgency of the need for change is necessary to get a university to move. Any additional suggestions? Yes, and I believe inclusive leadership is top down and bottom up. And the reason I was willing to go to McGill, for example, is that the you know they had already developed a strategy to address anti-black racism. Um, I wasn't coming in and having to create something new. Um, they were very committed to it, as we can see in the actual results um, of you know. I mean, I, I tell a lot of stories about the hiring we've done, which has just been a really incredible people. But, um, you know, if you don't have that buy-in at the top, it's really hard for you know, people to, to, who are working from the classroom level and so on to, to get that, that change going. And so, um, but those people who are, you know, faculty and students are what often what creates change. So it's the ongoing demands of faculty and students that often get the leadership to change, but also to get those the right leadership in place. And you know, the other thing I really encourage people to do is, um, you know, we need allies to be stepping up into those positions. And you know, that's everything from you know being department chair to you know working on the, you know being on the faculty council to focus on inclusive. Uh, you know, curriculum and pedagogy and to make those, you know, get your faculty councils and senates to, to say we, we need to be more inclusive, you know, and to do that, you got to get people. And it's not just saying, you know, Terry, you have to go join the faculty council. It's I need my allies to go and join the allies to go and join the faculty council and to take those leadership positions and, you know, to make sure that we're doing things in a way that is, is going to, um, you know, increase our support and, and acceptance and and uh, creating an, a better environment for students of all backgrounds. Nicely said, very well said. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you again for the, uh, for the powerful question, Rick. And Rick is uh, coming to us from um, a vice provost position. So he's someone who knows exactly uh, where he speaks from. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, since, since we're coming close to the end, and right now there's a pause in that torrent of questions, let, let me take the moderator's privilege and ask, and ask you one. Mm -hmm. What might a college or university look like, say, six years down the road, if they embrace radical empathy um, for, the, for the whole system, for residence life, for pedagogy, for um, research? What, how does that campus look different in, say, six years or so? Well, first of all, they'll have students flocking to go there because they know it's a place where they're going to feel welcome. I mean, the, the, you know, the interesting thing is we look, I swear, you know, for both students and faculty, we often look at higher ed as, as the hazing you mm -hmm. know, process. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to throw you into this calculus class and we're, we're you know, you, you, 50 percent of the students fail and can't go on to you know study uh pre-med and, and you know it's, it's like we need to get out of that attitude and i have to say you know we went to some lengths on that when i was at university of texas at austin we had a really great uh, vice provost um david laudy who has lots of great stories about how he changed his practices and he said wait a second these students got in 
I shouldn't be, you know, hazing them and making it difficult for them to, you know, get through. Uh, and so if we look at it from a, a, a more, you know, nurturing perspective from saying we actually, you know, we want you to come and once you're here, we want you to get through and we, you know, we aren't going to throw a whole bunch of hurdles in your way. In fact, we're going to give you this support and resources. So, I mean, you're going to see an institution that has programs, you know, bridge programs. Somebody was talking about um, how they getting more students acculturated to college. So when I was at UT Austin, we in at Menlo College, when I was provost there, we created these bridge programs. And but, you know, stepping back and getting to the high school level and supporting high schools and working with students or these organizations like Foundation for a College Education, that acculturation can start in high school. Um, and then we can create bridge programs that help students who are first gen or, or new and help them, uh, you know, understand the unwritten curriculum <laughs> and, uh, you know, all these things you need to understand to, to be successful in college and how to go to office hours and, you know, how to um, use the writing center and the library and all these different things. And, um, and then uh, thinking about training faculty so that they understand that their job is, you know, first of all, teach faculty how to teach, which we don't do. Um, but also um, help faculty understand, you know, which is what I was doing a couple of years ago, but uh, that's kind of fallen by the wayside, is training faculty to understand what it means to be an administrator um, and, you know, get more faculty of goodwill into administrative positions so that we can start creating the change that will lead to a more inclusive environment and treating our, our junior faculty like human beings and our grad students. You know, I mean, there's so many ways to, to talk about this. This is, this is radical. Um, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the chat, uh, folks have come up with a few different additions. Uh, Lisa recommends that we need to change our mindset from half fail to 100% ACE courses. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it, it resonates for me, I think what you're describing with the idea of uh, 360 degree or wraparound services that uh, mm -hmm. universities and colleges are that much more supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, John uh, Hollenbeck uh, mentioned, no, excuse me, Jim Venides mentions the classic, look to your left, look to your right, the three of you, all of you have what it takes to succeed, which is a, mm -hmm. a remarkable thing. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, we, we uh, Kelly Simpson has snuck in under the wire. Uh, she's got one more question. I wanna make sure we get this up. Um, if time on that note, what resources do you recommend for teaching faculty to teach? That is an area we're actively digging into at my institution. Um, yes. Uh, so, you know, I wish we would do something when they're still in graduate school. I mean, you know, what drives me crazy is that you were at these institutions of higher education that actually have schools that teach pedagogy and how to develop curriculum, you know, schools of education, and we, there's no interaction. So if you are at an institution that has a school of education, I would highly recommend that you reach out to them and have them, you know, some schools also have teaching and learning uh, centers or, or programs. Um, but, you know, if I were, if I had a magic wand, um, first of all, I would start with graduate students, but you know, since we aren't teaching our graduate students how to teach for the most part, I would say you know every new faculty member should have uh, you know their first semester off, and they should have to take courses on how to teach and how to, but also not just on how to teach, but on what the culture of the institution is. You know, hmm. shadowing a good teacher. Um, you know, how to use the, giving them real information and hands-on uh, experience with using the, uh, you know, university's different systems for, you know, everything from, you know, the course management to, you know, grading systems to, you know, I mean, you're expected to learn this stuff on the fly and, or to take some online module. You really need to sit down with people and say, okay, we're going to have a, we're going to sit down and walk you through how to set up a class and, you know, how to, submit your grades and, and you know all these different things so if it, if, if I, it were up to me you know faculty wouldn't start off just jumping into the classroom like i did 20 years ago they would actually um you know be able to sit down and, and walk through all these different things so that when they start that next semester they aren't just you know flailing and trying to figure things out on their own that's this, this all sounds like staggeringly radical um mm -hmm. and yet and yet incredibly just um, and, and humane to everybody. Uh, in the chat, uh, one person uh, praised you for mentioning administrators. I think that's Carrie uh, Pennell. 
uh, all the way to students and faculty. And I, I love the way you've broken this out into different different categories. You, we are out of time, but in the meantime, you've given us a vision of a transformed campus. Uh, mm -hmm. I, sorry. Can I make one last comment to David's? Because Please. one other thing I did when I was at Menlo College is we actually brought alumni in to provide feedback and commentary on our curriculum. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, you know, it helped us update the curriculum and make sure that we were providing the latest um, information uh, so that they would, you know, when they went out to get jobs, they weren't behind on what was happening in marketing or things like that. So anyway, one last comment. Well, that's, that's a great comment to add. Um, listen, how can we uh, keep up with you? Besides, you know, besides, when we're done reading Radical Empathy, what's what's the best way? Do we follow you on Twitter or? Yeah, do, well, I'm on, I'm on all social media. Yeah, Twitter, um, Facebook. Um, the, the two best places to follow me are Twitter and LinkedIn. I'm, I post there pretty regularly. Um, I was excited to get a 10 out of 10 on Room Raider. Uh, on Twitter, <laughs> which I was using a very different background. But um, in any case, um, and then terrygivens.com, um, but that's in the process of changing. And for those who are interested, um, like if you're interested in workshops or anything, we do provide those. And it's um, with through Brighter Professional Development, all one word, dot com. Um, or just reach out via email. Um, Terry at terrygivens.com is uh, my personal kind of consulting email. Very nice, very nice. And Joel Bloom just raced in and put your LinkedIn there. Um, Thank you. So we can find you everywhere. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for this book. Just Google me. There aren't a lot of Terry Gibbonses out there. No, we, <laughs> we need a lot more of you. Um, <laughs> thank you for this book. Thank you for this hour of conversation. And thank you for everything you do, Terry. Thanks. It's really great to see you again, Brian. And I hope we get to meet face to face someday soon. <laughs> I, I can't wait. I can't wait. As soon as we get past all this. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Take care. But don't leave yet, friends. Let me just point out where we're headed over the next few weeks. Uh, and thank you for all these fantastic questions. If you'd like to keep talking about empathy, about structural racism, about can the academy be overhauled productively, uh, follow us on Twitter. Use the hashtag FTTE to keep these ideas going. Or head over to my blog, brianalexander.org, if you'd like to uh, keep more of this conversation going. Uh, if you want to look ahead, we have more topics coming up on the forum, including the climate crisis, libraries and careers, minority students on campus, public higher ed, whatever Web3 is, and how to transform the academy. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Uh, if you'd like to go back into our past sessions, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions on mental health, um, on empathy, and especially on race and racism, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. And above all, everybody, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for thinking uh, together. Thank you for, as Terry puts it, being vulnerable with each other. Thank you for all these ideas. Good luck working. This is a, a wild month with an awful lot going on. My best wishes for all of you, for your safety. Please take care, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye. <laughs>